Good morning, good morning. Audio test looks good. Hey, it's a bit of a cloudy day here. It's clouded in. No rain, but uh, a bit overcast today. The same blue bicycle. Ha ha ha. So we have a new theory then. This is clearly not something left behind by a drinker. It's become a regular thing, the blue bicycle. We need a new theory. Good morning, gang. We have lots of fan action this morning here. I don't know why. My fans are spinning high. Have I done something wrong? Just a sec while I check to see what's running in the background. Just a moment. I just had a restart, so it should be okay. Adobe Assistant, give me a break. No idea, we'll see. Kill that. Adobe CEF Helper. Okay, maybe that'll help. Okay. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. So the person on the bicycle, it's not working for the shop. There's nobody here next door. Their shutter is tightly closed. There's nobody in there right now. So I don't think it's, unless it's somebody that leaves it there. I don't know. No idea. No idea. So my PC is mining crypto. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, okay. Oh, oh. Did you see it? Sorry about that. Okay, this morning, before I do the carving, before I do the carving, we have some embossing. It's another one of those embossing days. We are churning out prints here. We are churning out prints. And Kubota-san still, as you know the story, he won't do his own embossing. So it's up to Dave here to do it. Actually, what the, uh, what the package is here, you know, it's, it's, an, uh, it's uh, an order going out. Ukiwe Heroes prints. This is an order that came in from Jed. And he wants five of these, 10 of these, five of these, 10 of these, 15 of these, 20 of these, X of these, X of these. This is how it works. And we make the prints here and we hold them in storage. There's only one customer for these prints. We have only one customer. We make them and hold them here. And every now and then Jed calls over and says, okay, give me 10 of these, 10 of these, five of these, five of these. Jed buys them from us. So Jed is, Jed is the owner of the series. It's Jed's uh, intellectual property. Jed sells them. We don't even sell them here from our own website. This is all Jed, and we're the factory behind him, and we make them in advance. We can't make them to order. He orders five of these, ten of these. We will make them at that pace. We can't do that. So we make them in advance, try and keep ahead of him, and then he orders uh, as, he, as he requires for his website. So it's easy for him, actually. He doesn't have to pay a huge bunch to keep inventory. So we're the ones who, uh, who actually make the investment initially to make the things, and then he uh, orders them from us as he needs them. It uh, works fine for both of us, keeps our printers busy, and he's always got stock on hand whenever he needs it. But the one, the one downside for me is one of our printers, Kubota Sound, the most experienced, best printer we've got, he refuses to put his name on products. So I have to do it for him. His, his idea is, you want my name on? It's up to you, you do what you want, but I'm not gonna spend and waste my time doing that. <laughs> He's nice about it, but he's adamant about it. The craftsman's names do not belong on the prints. It's his, it's his age group. That must have been Suga-san. Oh, Suga-san, good morning, hello, hello, hi. Hey. Hey. Hi, okay, see, sir, hey. I have no mask. No, you put my gratis. So, 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 so. The clans are gathering. Somebody said the paper out, it's out. Two of them are already there. That's Suga-san going up, and about 10 minutes ago, Ishikawa-san came up. It's on a decision day today. The four, fourth print in this year, in this series, you saw me carving a bit of it on Thursday. Today's decision day. They have each done a couple of batches of tests with different colors. So we got four batches and mixed to choose from. And after I finish the stream, I'm going up there and we're gonna have a party, a powwow, and it's going to be decision day. Let's test this, where am I? Not that one. 
That's right, it's this one. And we have some real decisions to make because what they have done this time is they have stretched out. The first samples they made were um, classical. There's a sky, make it blue. There's a ground, make it green something. There's a tree, make it bark color. Their first sample was completely classical. And we looked at it, we looked at it, we looked at it. And we all sort of sat there looking at these small samples and we all just had the same idea. This is just kind of too boring. They were okay, nothing wrong with them, but they were definitely boring. So we, they, we all had the same, how can we make this, how can we make this interesting? Not strange, but how can we make this interesting? And the answer was chocolate. Check. It says, bull, I indeed did car feeds. It's Kubota. Kubota said, did indeed print these. Double check, double check. Here's what we're doing then for the next half hour. For those of you who haven't seen it before, we have a polymer plate here with characters in reverse. We didn't carve this. It's a polymer plate from a printing company. And I am going to use it to emboss the shape of the craftsman who made this print. And it says, hori, carving, buru. Hori buru. Suri printing Kubota Kenichi. He's the man who printed it. He's older than me, five years or so older than me, very highly respected printer in town. So for the next 30 minutes or so, you're going to see this thing repeated again and again and again and again. And then after that, we will move to carving, and after that, we will move to show and tell. And today's show and tell is two things. We have a one minute update on the previous show and tell, and then we will move to today's items. Venezuela, wow, oh. no. No idea the time zones. What time zones are South America? It's now eight o'clock in the morning for me, so f for you it would be, I don't know, two o'clock in the afternoon maybe? Okay. So why do we make it damp here? I could do this actually on completely dry paper. It would be okay. With the paper dry, if I, if I did this, in fact, let's do that just a minute here. I don't want to spoil one of these, but we have washi. There's washi standing by. These are off cuts. It's the same paper exactly. I could do it, I could do it dry. And the shape would go in, and at first glance, it would be no different. There it is, it's embossed. At first glance, it would be no different. And perhaps we're pretty much 90x percent the same. But the normal procedure, <coughs> the normal procedure for this embossing is the printer, while the paper is still moist when they're putting all the colors on, they do the embossing and then it dries after the embossing is done. And rather than embossing on dry, compared to embossing on moist and letting it dry, I feel just a little bit that the one done properly that, that is let dry later is a bit longer lasting. I have no way to confirm this because we're talking about 200 years, so I don't know. 
but I'm feeling that the dry one sort of gets compressed and will bounce back a little bit. This one gets compressed and then dried, and I feel that it will bounce back a bit less, I think. This is not scientifically measured. This is just simply, we make prints on moist paper and dry them. And I'm just a little bit, if I get that a little bit moist, I feel this will bite a little bit better. But there's no way would I go to the trouble of making the whole paper moist and doing this and then drying it out again. Of course not. And what we can't do, because we end up doing this sometimes for trouble, if I, uh, it's a name, what's gonna say, if I did this now and then realized that, oh, we've forgotten one of these colors, well, that's okay, no problem. We can re-moisten the paper, put it in the stack, and we can print a color again. We can do that all the time. We do that all the time when we're testing. But if I did that now, after putting the embossing in, if I now took this stack and moistened them for reprinting, that embossing will definitely weaken because with the addition of moisture here, the paper swells up and we would lose half of our embossing. So absolutely you can't do it that way. You can't moisten it after doing this embossing. And that's a bit of trouble for me because sometimes when I'm taking the old prints and removing them from glued on backing, I have to do that by putting them in a bath of hot water. And that means I can't do that if there's a lot of embossing in the kimono patterns or something. I can't wash it in hot water because the embossing definitely gets weaker. This is one of the best designs in that series, you know. Had an early home run. Boy, oh boy, this is a good design, you know. It's not just a good design by itself. It's a good thing for our Ukiwe Hero series, you know. We're, these are parodies. But if you imagine if the copyright owner, the game company who made this, if, I mean, they're not, but if you imagine if they were going to be uh, hostile towards us or something, there's nothing they could do about this. It's four animals. It's a fox, a falcon, a frog, and a rabbit. Okay, in the sky. The other part of this print that really pleases me on this is that some of our Ukiwa Heroes prints they really, you need to know the game and know the character for the thing to have any meaning. So for, for game fans, they're cool. For everybody else, it's like, what am I looking at? What's this? But a print like this, a bunch of Jed's early ones, they don't depend on knowledge of the game to be an interesting object. I mean, I like this thing. I carved it, I know what I love. This print as a visual thing. And I haven't got a clue about the game. And it doesn't matter. So he, Jed has transcended the actual original theme here. That's so cool. I shouldn't say this, but I think people are going to be enjoying these things for hundreds of years to come. You know? I think Jed's really carved himself a position. We'll see. What do I know about it? says he didn't make the connection. Like a fox and a falcon and a rabbit and a frog flying in the sky. <laughs> okay, <laughs> what other hints would you need? <laughs> Do I know if foreigners are allowed to visit Japan this year? At the moment, it's shut. 
At the moment, foreigners are not allowed to visit. There's special circumstances, like the Olympic chief was allowed in last week to have meetings and stuff like this, blah, blah, blah. The final decision, of what if the decision on the Olympics was made just a couple of days ago. No foreign visitors will be allowed in to watch the Olympics. As far as you say, this year, by December, what will happen? Of course, I don't have a clue. It's not looking good. And the one reason it's not looking good is that even though, for example, America, they're vaccinating everybody twice a day and whatever, that's cool, but Japan is not vaccinating anybody. I think we are now approaching 200,000 in total who have been vaccinated. At the current pace, my group is included. At the current pace, my group is included about nine years from now. <laughs> so no way during the course of this year will any substantial portion of the Japanese population be vaccinated which means they don't want visitors. We, we don't want visitors. So if you're thinking about visiting Japan later in this year, I really, really would encourage you not to buy your ticket yet. And there's only the tiniest trickle of people, you know, super businessmen who can buy their way in to, to blah, 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 you know. No, general visitors, forget it. And whether you've got your vaccine passport or not, I think would be pretty much irrelevant. Because we don't. And we won't for a very, very, very long time. It's one of the downsides of the Japanese character, you know, and all, whatever. There's good things and bad things. One of the downsides is the fear of making a mistake, the fear of having something go wrong, the fear of having somebody be left out. And all of these things are making this vaccination thing proceed at an absolute snail's pace. What if something bad happened? What if we missed one of those people there? Let's reorganize this, otherwise we'll miss somebody or do something. And it works at the snailest of snailest of snail's pace. And it's sort of, maybe that's the safest way to do things, maybe. But the downside is here we are in the middle of a pandemic and we have 135 million people who are not vaccinated. And new variants out there. So given those circumstances that this country has kept the infection rate extremely low, it means it's kept the vulnerability extremely high. And because we are vulnerable now, very much so, there's no way they're going to let visitors in. I think that's the kind of situation, too, that is facing New Zealand. And how would they handle this as we go forward? I don't know. New Zealand, obviously, as we know the story, they've been really, really good about keeping it out. They, they've had it down there. There have been some episodes. They lock down, do this, do this. But the result of that is you've got a population who is now completely and totally vulnerable. Don't know, don't know, complicated stuff. Just joining, I'm about halfway through the stack here. I'll be doing this for another few minutes. And then for those of you just joining, here we are. What we're putting in is embossing. We're putting the craftsman's name onto this print. It's my name, I carved this, and Kubota-san is the man who printed it. Jed is working with these two old dudes, designed by 30-year-old 30, 30 Jed, I guess, about six or seven years ago. He was about 30 at the time, I guess, I don't know. and printed by me and Kubota Sun.
You see me doing this, and it's taking me, what, about 15, 20 seconds for each one or something, that's okay. But what you're seeing here, actually, too, remember, it's the same process that the printer used, Kubota-san, when he did this actual whole print. He had this stack of paper, whatever it is, 70 sheets, 80 sheets. He's got his wood block, and for each and every one of them, he rubs the color, rubs the color. You've seen the videos, pulls out the blank paper, rubs one color, one color rubs carefully, one carefully inspects, puts it aside. Goes through this entire stack just for that blue color or something. Then you start all over again just for the green color, just for this. There's, I think there's 13 colors on this print. So what you're seeing me do this morning in a very quick, quick, quick fashion, he has to do very slowly and carefully 13 times for the entire stack. And on some of the, the wider colors, the deeper colors with wider areas, the background here, he will have done this twice. And it won't be five seconds of rubbing. It's going to be rub, 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 good, rub, rub, good, rub, 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 looks good, peel looks okay, rub, 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 you know, a few minutes work. It is a big, big deal, but the results are fabulous. On our YouTube channel, there's a set of videos, four videos on making this print, all the carving and all the printing. There's a set of four videos that show the complete production of this print on our YouTube channel. And it'll be now seven years ago. It'll be from 2013, I think. Yes, 2013. sharpening. Which natural stones are you using for sharpening? Well, I have bad news. These days I don't use many natural stones for sharpening. And even when I did, we are not specifically even careful about it. Uh, compared to people like uh, shrine carpenters or whatever, they have big wide planes, they have chisels, they have big tools. They have to be really strict and specific about the kind of stones they use. In our world here, because our tools are so physically small, the area of blade, we can basically use any old stone. You're asking me types, Uchigomori, I don't even know what that means, I'm sorry. Koma Nagara, we use Nagara, but I don't know. So we are not so, uh, it doesn't matter to us. I used, when I was using standard stones, I just used a rough arato, which means literally rough stone of a generic type. Didn't know where it was from or what company or what type, didn't matter. Cut the blade down on the arato, then use a nakato, which is maybe something around a 1200 grit to take away the scratches from the arato. And then I switch to a generic shiagito, finishing stone. All generic stuff, nothing special, and it works a treat. So I have to sort of disappoint you if you're expecting you know, sharpening information from this master guru here who can guide you to this particular strata of this particular mountain, and that's the one. <laughs> there are people to whom that means something. There are carpenters out there to whom that means something. They want to know what mountain and what strata level. That's not the world I live in. You know. It's not because our tools are junk. Our tools are very, very beautiful, wonderful steel. But it's because the surface area is so small. could be from one of those guys, he's just thinking, I'm so dense and I don't get it. That's possible too. Did I ever
or use a stone from the Ome riverbed for sharpening? No. For working on the baron, yes. We use river stones. Né? Finish about ten left, I think. Hang in there, gang. Mm, ten or twelve, whatever. We'll see. Just hang in. So, so it's got the synthetic stones too. I also am using syn syn blah, 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 synthetic stones these days. You know, we've been using even, we've been showing them on the stream. We are now using steel, steel, I don't know, di diamond stones. What are they called? Diamond grit on top of uh, plates. And these work really well for us, very, very well. As I said, I don't want to be too blasé about that. To some people with tools that may need sharpening in a certain way, natural stones, maybe for them, is absolutely the best way to go. I know. So I don't want to be too off the cuff. It doesn't matter, get anything, it's okay. Just simply, again, for us, for our specific requirements, a very simple sharpening system works really, really, really well. Why am I don't doing this with ink? That's interesting. I know it is possible. Many of the old prints, of course, did have this done with ink. When you look at the uh, Shin hunger prints, the Doi hunger prints, and stuff like that, they did this work with, uh, with, with ink. You could actually read it. Why am I doing it this way? It's a quirk for me. I don't want that thing to be too invasive to the picture. You know, the, the illustration is there, and the prints are fairly small. When they were doing those Shin hunger prints with ink, you're talking about prints that are quite large with a small signature in one corner. These are fairly small, and I felt that to put this in here with ink, it would have been okay, but I felt it would be a bit disruptive. In other words, the information is there if you want to hunt for it, but it's not, it's not in your face. Final few here. These weren't a subscription prints, they're not. They're just a single single prints for sale, what we call here in Japanese as tampin, just prints. These are not a subscription set. They're too expensive for subscription sets. For a print that we sell month by month by month, a series, the <coughs> excuse me, gotta be cheaper than this, so. When we mess up when we engrave what happens to the misprints, that doesn't happen. I know. When we mess up when we're carving, the block gets repaired, of course, before we start printing. So there are no misprints from a carving error. 
when we are printing sometimes, there are misprints. The paper will slip, the color will be in the wrong place. There are test prints for every single print we issue, for every single batch of prints we make. When Kubota-san here sat down with the 80 sheets to do this, and he's cut. So there are a few that are no good, that are not gonna be acceptable. So we have printing misprints, we just toss them aside. But there are no carving misprints. Last one. Okay, there are still people who have just joined us, so just one more final time, show what we've done. We have a polymer plate here, a piece of plastic with some lettering built into it, and we're using that plastic plate to rub an embossment with the name of the people who made the print. Hori Carving Buru, which is me, Dave Bo, Sudi Printing Kubota Kenichi, the name of the man who printed it. And this is the last stage in our print production for all of our prints, except the tiny small ones where there's no room for this. Okay, that's over for the day. Good, let's get on to some real work. These prints now go up onto the shelf upstairs and they will sit quietly until such time as Jed says, send me over 10 more or 20 more or whatever. And we keep these for all our combinations. This is Bull and Kubota. This one is Bull and Yamamoto. This one is Kawasaki, one of our carvers and Kubota. And this one is Nagao and Kubota. So that we've got these made up for all the possible combinations of workers here. We had a tiny problem a couple of years ago. One of our girls uh, got divorced and she went back to put her name to what it was before. So we had to remake all the plates. And then no sooner had she done that than another one of our girls got married and changed her names. So we had to go back and make all the plates again for her name. So it's never ending. Okay, real work, 8.32. We're one third of the way through our stream here today. We are still on this block. We are still on this block. Today, for sure, this is the final day you will be seeing this particular piece of wood because now we're almost done. All that's left is one tiny area of hair carving on this little puppy. Then we've got to do some persuading, and then we are out of here. And the next job you'll see me doing, today's Saturday, it'll be Monday, it might be color transfers, we'll see. Again, I shouldn't promise what we're gonna be doing because just there's so many interruptions and things, who knows what we're gonna be doing. So I shouldn't promise anything, shouldn't even tell about what we're gonna be doing, just let it happen. Okay, can you see the areas here? There's still a couple of areas just around this eye that have not been carved yet. Let's get to them. Oh, Jetsan's here. Jetsan, good morning, good morning, good morning. Hey, 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 did you see? I know. Oh, sure. No. We got your email the other day. Cameron prepped me an invoice. Jed's here this morning. He can see this is a package just getting ready. All the prints you've asked for, they're all in stock. Every one that you've asked for is still, uh, still, in it's still in stock. We know what these are. Beautiful, clean copies of all of these things. One thing to watch out for, Jed, when you get these, some of the prints you're gonna get here are ones that you signed while you were here last time. But in each package, there will be prints maybe that you haven't signed because that, you know, it's the bottom of the package. So please check carefully when you get these. Some are signed and some are not. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful batch of prints. He 
He says, he compliments you a lot. What do you mean, Jed compliments me? Sure he does, but uh, for me, Jed's the guy who saved our business. You guys all know the story. Back in 2012, 2013, I was trying to fly this Mocha Hong Kong thing and it wasn't flying. We weren't selling anything that we had thought we were gonna be doing. And Jed came in in 2012 with that uh, project to do the Sukiyo Heroes and he saved it, saved this workshop. And the other thing Jed is doing, maybe some of you guys don't know this, if somebody can pop up the UQA Heroes link here, Jed is not just working with us now, Jed is sponsoring, using his own money, dumping it on the table, helping other craftsmen get going. Jed's now got, you tell me Jed, on your website you've got prints from us, you've got prints from uh, uh, William Francis in England, and he's got prints there from uh, Steve Winiecki in New York, I don't know, sorry, I don't know where Steve is living. And then now a new one from Camilo in Mexico, who may be watching this. Uh, Camilo's prints are now on Jed's website. And uh, uh, Cal Carlisle, Jed's got some of his prints. So Jed is turning out to be a, a, a publisher. And already, even at this little level, Jed is one of the world's major woodblock print publishers. It's just like it's been that easy. getting fatter. Jed and I Skype from the chest up. <laughs> so when Jed, some years back, he's joking, but he was sort of getting a little bit, whatever, I guess he, he was too much work and not exercising enough. And now in the COVID era, I used to do print parties running around, go to all my up and down the stairs on my bicycle everywhere. Now I've been stuck in my room here. I almost never leave this building. I've gained five kilos it, since we closed the shop. From March 17th to now, I've gained five kilos. But I guess it doesn't go to my face, it's going to somewhere else. All funded with pins and shirts. I don't think that's true. <laughs> The COVID pounds, a common problem. Yeah, yeah, I know. Never in my life have I ever thought about this. Maybe I shouldn't have that beer or maybe I shouldn't have that dessert. You know, I've, I've ignored it all my life. Just eat what I want, do what I want because the body weight has never changed. So I became an adult, the body went to about 60 kilograms, 62 kilograms, slowly edged up to about 63. I think when I hit 63 as age, my weight and my age crossed. My age gradually crossed up and crossed over my weight at 63. And I was on the scale in the public bath a couple of nights ago and they're both 70. <laughs> my age and my weight have crossed. I guess the age took over, got larger. The weight thought, hey, wait a minute, I wanna be number one. <laughs> so the weight came up and up and up and now the weight has crossed over again. Yeah, the food neighborhood, this is it too. And my God, the food is getting so much better around here. This is really interesting. Over the last year, you know, everything shut down in March or so, and a lot of my favorite restaurants were gone. Well, I don't go in restaurants anymore because I'm not vaccinated, but the takeout thing. So I lost a whole bunch of my favorite restaurants. And last year I put out a little uh, Dave's Restaurant Guide to Asakusa, and it was, uh, it was obsolete before we even sent it and around half of those restaurants are gone. And I was like, oh my God, it's the end of the world. But what has happened is, this has really been something interesting. You know, I don't know how this applies globally, but in my neighborhood here, I see this. There was this stunning bad thing that happened. Shut down, no tourists, no customers, shut down. Businesses closed right and left, but now, there's a, a, a renaissance, and we're still in the middle of this, but there's a renaissance here. There are new businesses opening up. There are new buildings going up. And it seems that this was a chance that it cleared out. This is what they talk about, right? The, the capitalism thing, the, uh, what's the word they talk about? Destructive, I forget the word, destructive capitalism or destructive or whatever. And it actually is a thing. It really is a thing. And this, this district is coming to fabulous life.
there's a place down the street they made, I got a sandwich here the other day. It was a pulled pork and coleslaw sandwich. Something that would have been inconceivable in Japan. Japanese would be just like, what's that? And it was to die for. So I'm really, really, really looking forward to the next few years, you know, assuming I don't die from this thing. You know. Creative destruction, that's the expression, right? Creative destruction. And it's a thing. I just have to dance around and hope I'm not one of the ones that gets destroyed. Can't do both, can't watch and can't carve at the same time. So somebody's mentioned World War II. I mean, that's sort of the ultimate thing. You have a war like World War II, which to Japan, you know, I mean, destroyed everything, irrespective of whether good war, bad war, who's the bad guys, who's the good guys. Irrespective of that, there you are in 1945, it's destroyed. And we've seen what happened, the creative things and the hard work and everything that happened after that, just astonishing, astonishing. Am I, am I off the camera? Just a sec here, where are we? That's, that's here. Okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Right. Is that the location? Just ask me, are people priced out? I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not sure what you mean. I know the economy here is sort of just, you know, hanging in. It runs on debt. The Japanese economy is like the most indebted economy in, in the, on the planet. And that was the same before the pandemic, and it's the same afterwards. So I'm not so sure about that, how the overall global economy is going to handle all these staggering amounts of debt that are being built up. The American, you know, this, this money they're giving to people and stuff like that. So I have no idea how that's going to play out. I have no idea on that part of it. But, uh, but here and now on the ground, it's buzzing and booming for those that survived, you know. There's one area of the Shin Nakamise, the arcade street behind me. It's been a, a flourishing little arcade. It's been okay. No one would have said there was a problem with it a year ago. There's a mix of tourist shops and local shops and blah, blah, blah. Okay, this thing came along last year and it destroyed a bunch of the businesses in there. And what we see now, there's one place you go in there, just behind uh, where I am here, walk to the next block, and some of the landowners have got together and they have torn down an entire block of buildings there that, that face that street. And they were clearly buildings that were long past their time. But there was no chance to do that because they were, they were you know, up and running businesses in them. But now what's happened is because the businesses were struggling and or collapsed, the landowners had a chance to get together and rebuild, and there's an entire block there that is getting completely refreshed and rebuilt. And something that wouldn't have been possible without this, uh, without this destruction that happened. It's in some sense it's sad because a bunch of, of old friends are disappearing and a bunch of people are being hurt by this. But in its place, new stuff is, is uh, thriving.
There's also another aspect to that thing that's uh, changed very much over the past year. If you go back, for example, two years ago, we were already at that point thinking, I wonder if we could, you know, buy this building and rebuild it and all that kind of stuff, blah, 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 blah. And all, as, as part of the investigation of that, I poked around and asked questions and, you know, this and that, this and that, this and that. It turned out that one of the barriers in our ability to do that a couple of years ago was the lack of, uh, what's the word? The construction industry, the people who tear down buildings and build, build buildings, you know, there's the giant construction companies and there's small local construction companies. They were all totally jammed out and booked up. And anybody who was trying to get something built or something made had to work X years in advance to get their project scheduled. It was a labor shortage and it was a company shortage. That has now blown up. And because of the lack of huge office buildings being built in Tokyo, that kind of stuff has now completely come to a standstill. Nobody is putting up new 30-story office towers because all of a sudden it looks like a new telework area is here and getting the financing and making those things work financially has become a problem. So because of that, many of the very, very, very large construction companies, their business model has now changed. And instead of putting up these massive 40-story towers, that workforce, that labor force, that uh, those companies are available for smaller scale projects. And we see that right now in our district here. There are dozens, I haven't counted them, but there are dozens of new buildings under construction right here in this Asakusa Square area. We've never seen that before. There's small cranes everywhere. There are, you know, the building wraps everywhere. Everywhere you go, you see construction and buildings being renovated. Because now with the labor force suddenly available and money still free, you know, if you're borrowing for that stuff, the interest rates are still next to nothing, good or bad, I don't know. So it's a huge, there you're gonna see Tokyo physically rebuilt in the more smaller neighborhood scale. Over the past few years, it's been rebuilt at the, the giant district scale, new Shibuya, new Maranuchi, all that kind of stuff. Now it's working at a different level. Okay, that's done. Yeah, how the apartment scene changes. It's very much in flux, and uh, I know nobody can figure this out, how this is gonna work. Already, over the past X years, it has become cheaper to, to rent places and buy places in Tokyo. This is pre-COVID. In the bubble era, the land prices here were so massive, nobody could afford to live here. They bought two hours out, commuted in. Over the past decade or so, that has gradually reversed, and there have been many apartments built down by the bay and stuff like this. But how that's gonna change now, I don't know. The thought is that it's gonna go back the other way, that because of teleworking now, this is gonna make it much easier for people to work for modern companies from their home, and they don't even need to be commuting distance from Tokyo, they can be out in the boonies. So one thought is that this could really, uh, uh, improve the life out in the uh, urban area, out in the uh, rural areas, and decrease the population of Tokyo. But I don't know. I don't know how that's going to go because Tokyo is still an attractive place to live. There's a buzz. There's activities. There's stuff to do. So even if it's not just being close to your work as being important for you, it's being in the middle of a vibrant city, and that's not going to go away in a hurry. So this is very much an open question now. Not just for Tokyo, New York, you name it. The same thing is happening now in many, many places.
you know, you're surprised your Japanese companies are accepting teleworking, whatever. It isn't, it isn't uh, accepted here yet. It's not smooth. There's lots of reports in the newspaper about problems with this. And the, the kind of problems here with teleworking, I don't know how applicable they are to other countries. One of the problems is the Japanese houses, of course, are so freaking small. We have this problem. Cameron, he won't be here today because it's Saturday, he's off. But we have this problem. Cameron went home to work because he's got a new baby, and it turned out that it wasn't all it's cracked up to be because he's got a, a nice little Japanese house. They rented it and chose it based on the fact they were having a new baby. But what they didn't do was choose a house based on a new baby plus a home office. And I had been thinking, Cameron, he's totally okay, he's fine, he's fine, he's fine. But when he was here to chat with me last week, he brought this up, and they are struggling with this. It's, it's not like the secrets here. They've got, you know, teleworking plus a new baby, and he's trying to decide what to do, you know, move, larger place, come back here and work. He's very much playing with this. So that's one part of it. The other problem that many Japanese people have with teleworking is the boss or the supervisor. The supervisor, of course, doesn't trust the workers. And they're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you working? Are you sure you're working? And there's stuff like they've got trackers on computers or just, wow. <laughs> And emails all night long and stuff, you know, whatever. It is a huge social problem here, absolutely. I mean, I might send Cameron an email. Maybe when I get off the stream today, for example, I'll, I remember something I need to talk to Cameron about, so I'll send him an email. But this is Saturday morning, and he knows, he and I both know the routine. I'll send the email, but I'm not sitting here Come on, guy, get the answer back to me. There will be no answer back from him until Monday morning. We know that. That's the way this works. So he gets emails from me, but uh, not, not in the sense of, uh, where are you? What are you doing? You know. Getting crackle on this mic. I'm not sure. Are you getting crackle, or are you getting... Computer, there's the mic is here, and when I move towards the computer, you certainly are going to get some uh, fan noise. And right now, there's a garbage truck outside which is making noise, so just maybe that might be part of it. If I turn off for a moment the outside mic, that's the outside mic now turned off. So I think that truck noise should have suddenly dropped. And what you're hearing now is me and the fan, and if I turn away from the fan. I can still hear a car going by. If I speak too loud, I think it probably crackles. This is a very sensitive microphone. If I turn back, the fan, eh, so, so. Yeah, when I turned, the fan sound went down. Well, just hang on there. A few more months when the new, the, the, the new Mac Pros come out with the M1 chip, running really cool, we'll be able to have a laptop running the stream with no fan sound. Hang on till the autumn, if I can afford it. The hotel AC noise, no, it's gone, because they're closed. This is a huge benefit to me from COVID. A huge benefit to me. I'm like half hoping that this will just continue, just so that I can be peaceful here. There's so many questions in the talk. I'm supposed to be carving you. I've got to get this block finished today. <laughs> She's not really running hot. This is pretty good. And in the summer, as we've learned, I have to put this up on a stand. It's not really super hot, but as soon as I open up OBS, the streaming software, the absolute fan kicks in.
But as I said, hang on a few months, and I think if I can afford it, if we're still okay when that new uh, model laptop comes out, the specs on those chips are just uh, just unbelievable, unbelievable. Oh, I left the outside. No, I put the outside mic back up, actually. I put it back on you. I turned it off for a minute, then I put it back up. The outside mic is on again. Is my stomach misbehaving again today? I had a, I had a nice, good cup of tea. <laughs> you missed it, actually. Ishikawa-san came today, just before the three the stream started. I think I was telling a story about her a couple of weeks ago. She and Sugu-san, one of our other printers here, they, on their day off, they both had it, you know, they, they took a day off together, and they went over to, uh, where was it, Shin Okubo. There's a bunch of shops there with the import food. I know Shin Okubo is kind of an, originally it was an area where there were a lot of Korean restaurants and things, but it's widened up now. There are Nepali restaurants and all kinds of stuff. There's a bunch of uh, shops over there that, are, that have imported spices. And the two of them went over there for a spice shopping day. And they bought tons and tons and bags and bags and bags of spices. And the reason they did is because Ishikawa-san when she was younger, she did a lot of traveling around Asia and stuff, and she learned to like chai tea. And uh, so she got the bug that she wants to try and make chai tea again. So she and Sugusan went over there and bought a bunch of spices. And for chai tea, what is it? It's you know, cinnamon, cloves, I don't even know, cinnamon cloves, cardamom, I don't know what else is in there. They bought a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of spices. And today, She's here, and Sugusan is here today, and they have planned something. And just before the stream started, she came in the door here on her way upstairs and said, "What's a good time for? For what time are you free today?" 
I'm like, well, I'm just here all day. Whatever's going on. There's a customer coming at one o'clock on an appointment. The rest of the day, I'm free. She said, okay, good. Okay, we'll do this at lunchtime. And she opened her bag, and the and she's brought a bag of these spices, and she's mixed up her own personal chai spice blend. And today they're gonna cook this upstairs. Ginger. So she said shoga. What did she say? Uh, it's cinnamon. She said cinnamon, cardamom, cloves, ginger, and there was one more. Oh, I can't remember it. Cardamom, cinnamon, ginger, cloves. She didn't say anise, pepper, go oh, pepper. Yeah, she said black pepper. Yes, yes. So that's, that's waiting for me. She's, they're they're going to do this today. They're printing this morning first. I said, we have our meeting, but we have to decide what the final colors are going to be on this print. And I, I mentioned the colors, you know, and chocolate is going to be a main color of this next print coming up. It's a print all about cherry blossoms and peacocks. And the answer was chocolate. Trust me, trust me. So we're going to get drunk on chai tea, decide on the ch tone of chocolate to buy. <laughs> <laughs> what a way to make a living. And also, they are, they also, they want to have a little bit of a meeting today. It's funny in Japanese, you know. The word meeting is understood by any Japanese person, you know. And they've heard me talk the last few weeks about the business and the corona and what's going on and the orders. And Cameron was here last week and we had a, a meeting about stuff. Anyway, today, Shikawa-san said, Yeah, kyo desu ne, meeting desu ne. And I'm like, uh, okay, okay. And in, in English, what it means is, she's like, we have to talk. And when the lady says to you, we have to talk. <laughs> so the two of them today, they've got something they have to talk about. And I know already what they want to talk about. They are starting to run scared because of the numbers that Cameron and I showed them last week. Uh, that we've talked about stream is not a secret. We are now the our subscription count after years of running at around 200 or so We are now sending I think the count Cameron gave me that it was 545 There are 545 subscription prints leaving this building every month And that's okay. That's cool. That's nice. The other number he gave me was that on one week alone in February 20 people signed up now, we're not getting 20 a week every week. The average is something like 1.5 a day. It's 1.5 to 2 a day, people signing up for subscriptions. It's great. We're happy, wonderful. People like our prints. Draw that forward, and somewhere around September, we will reach nearly 1,000 prints per day, per month, leaving here. And the girl said, we have to talk because we have a problem, and it's productivity productivity. So someone's saying, so looking to hire, we are looking to hire, but the problem is there's nobody in the world. Can I hire an accomplished printer to come in here and start working tomorrow? Of course, I would hire two of them, three of them, four of them. They don't exist. They don't exist. So what we have to do is we've got to try and jump forward. We've postponed this, we've procrastinated this, we've put it off, we've got to hire a bunch of people as trainee printers. And it is such a majestic, huge problem. We'd, we're just all burying our heads. No, you talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Because the problem, of course, is out of every X people you start, a very small percentage. Is it one in 10, one in 100? A very small percentage of them will continue. We'll enjoy the job, we'll like this, we'll find it congenial, we'll be skilled at it, and we'll continue. And the, the discussion today, we have to talk, is simply how are we going to bring on more people and who is going to do the training? Do I want to do it? No. Do they want to do it? No. Nobody wants to sit there 
and holds hand, holding hands with a beginner who almost certainly, statistically, is not going to be here X months down the road. And we've postponed it. I said we've postponed and procrastinated about this. But now the numbers are there in front of me. We can no longer ignore this. And foreigners are not the answer because they just, they can't get here with a visa. They don't stay. They don't want to be craftsmen. They want to be artists. They want to make a new design and make 10 copies and then get tired of it and then go on and do something else. We need craftsmen, not artists, craftsmen. I mean, we were joking about this, you know, okay, Dave, who do you need? What do you need, you know? Well, I need a, a young guy who is keel, capable, handy with stuff. I said guy, the reason I said guy is he doesn't get pregnant. His wife gets pregnant and all of a sudden he's got new kids, he's got a mortgage, there's debt on their credit card. This young guy needs to get to work. <laughs> so we can identify the person we need, but they're just not out there. Anyway, 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 what time is it? 9.06, we're still good to go. The carving part, no, at the moment, the, the crisis facing us is printers. Over the years, it has changed. At the moment, carving is looking okay. One is because I'm still okay here for another bunch of years. We have now working with us Chon San, who is way better than me. He's slower than me, but he's better. He's young. He's in his early 30s, mid-30s. We have Kawasaki-san working for us. She's, don't talk about her age, she's a lady. She's fine. She's a very steady, stable, average level, uh, very reliable young lady carver. So that's three of us. We have coming online, there's, you know, Tarankan. Is he here today? Whatever. He's not ready to bang start tomorrow full time. He is coming online and the time frame looks good. Over the next few years, he looks pretty reliable and good and, and very competent and like a nice guy. So that's a very, very possible potential. And he doesn't want to be an artist type running his own workshop. He wants to be a good carver with a good reputation and doing good work. So he needs the company to be able to give him the work. So that's looking, so carving is looking okay. Because remember, one carver in an established workshop with a history, with blocks behind it, a carver can support two, three, or four printers. If it's one-to-one, -one, it doesn't work. The carver spends a month doing this, the printer makes 100 copies and sits there for three weeks. It doesn't work. But it works fine. A car, any given carver can support a number of printers. So our problem is printers, printers, printers. Yeah, you saw the canvas bag maker. Yes, yes, yes. Why do those people hang around? It's personality. You know, if you're not the kind of person who would do that, I'd much rather do this and stitch canvas eight hours a day, then that's fine. You choose your own poison. So did you see the video that Cameron made with Sugasan last week? That little interview at the end of that video. And he chatted with her about this. You know, isn't it boring work, whatever. And I forget her exact words. She said, no, I like the repetitive work. It's repetitive, but it's still strict. You have to look at every single copy. It's stressful in that sense. There's people who get this. I get it, Sugisan gets it, Kubota-san gets it. There are people to whom it, it works. But identifying those people, no idea. Some says, Dave has to bust out the cane. I don't know what you mean. I know <coughs> in the old days, of course, their way of filtering was to bring in the people and be brutal to them. And the ones who were weak, emotionally, physically, they're out of there and you're just left with strong people. We can't do that these days. You don't start abusing people just to see who can put up with it. That's not the way it works anymore. I don't know. You know, it's all going to come from self-motivation these days. You know. Anyway, we got to figure this out. And, and now, with these numbers, we either find people or we turn off the website. Sorry, Mokohankan is full. We can no longer make prints for you. Or the other option, starting to jack up the prices to cut down the number of subscribers. And come on, come on. Come on.
So she says, "Kyo meeting this ne," and I'm like, "Hi." <laughs> I think she's going to be good cop, bad cop. She's going to give me some nice chai tea, and then she's going to say, solve this problem. What's funny, talk about weeding out applicants. I know, there's a story, there's a story about this that I heard. I've never done this or whatever. There's a story about this, that uh, somewhere X years ago, Adachi, who does this training, they get money from the government to train people, they quit, more money, more training, more quit, more money. I don't know if this is true, but somebody told me that one of their tests, on the first day when they're looking at all the applicants, they've got 10 people there, they're gonna pick two to be their next trainees. How do you do the first level of weed out of people who you think might be able to become good wood bar printmakers? And what I heard was they use this, a pencil, I don't know if this is true, I'm just repeating a story I've heard. They use a pencil and a cutter knife. And they prepare 10 pencils and 10 cutter knives, and they put them in front of these people. And they say, sharpen the pencil. And whatever, the person gets their cutter knife, and they get their pencils, and they sharpen their pencils. This was Kubota-san was telling us this. I remember that, Kubota-san. And he said, watching this person sharpen this pencil tells you all you need to know about whether they're going to have the physical capabilities to become a woodblock printer. We don't know about mental stamina, nothing about that, but do they have the ability to move their hands and do this and slide, and can they come up with a nice pencil? Because remember, nobody's got training these days. How many of you have ever sharpened a pencil with a knife? You know the way it is now. That's it. So you've never done this before, probably, or whatever. And how you pick up the knife, how you hold the knife, how you do this, how you solve the problem of how do I do this without cutting that side and making this even. And he says, this is that first level test. And I heard this a long time ago, and I'm thinking that that might not be a bad idea. If somebody can't handle this and they're fumbling and they cut their finger, then maybe they're not gonna be the kind of person who can do this kind of nice, delicate work. It starts to sound like the Google thing. Was, wasn't there a thing in the internet? Well, how do you get hired by Google? I don't know whatever true or not. There's these silly, stupid tests they have, and if you think out of the box, that's the kind of people they wanted. I don't know anything about that. But I also do remember reading a follow-up story to that where somebody inside Google had tracked this. He had tracked the results of these employees on their initiation tests, and he had tracked it against their performance in the company. And it was something like it was inverse relationship. The people who had aced those tests were the people who were the least productive once they got inside the company. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Oh, it's time, it's time. I was supposed to finish this. Doesn't matter. If I try and stress this and run it now, it's not going to work. So let's do this. Let's do this. My, the buzzer under my seat has gone off.
There's a hotline from John over there. He's got a buzzer that buzzes under my seat, if only. Let's look at some prints. Show and tell time. Like we don't have too much space today. Okay, come on. Before we start today's show and tell, we have a nice show and tell today. Before we start it, one minute on a pick up to yesterday's show and tell, the other day's show and tell. We showed some magazine prints from Okada Yoshio. And I didn't know at the time, but just at the very moment the stream was finishing, somebody posted a link to a book and said, here people, buy this book, you can get all those pictures. No, no, no. This is the paperback book that was linked in the stream. It has pictures from that series, one each, roughly one each from each of the chapters. They are washed out, watered down, very, very poor quality reproductions. It's all about the text. People want to read the text. So the pictures are there, but they're not so interesting and exciting and they're not so uh, pleasurable. But there are here about 50 of the illustrations from that series. And it's a cheap way to get it. I'll, uh, it was the Ernest BN number here. There's an ISBN nice number. Somebody clip this if you want it. Where's the light here? There's an ISBN number at the bottom of this book. Is that visible? Five, four, three, two, one. But having said that, there's a much better book available, or was available, and that's this one. It's Ezoshi Genji Monogatari, and it's Tanabe Seiko Bun, the story, and it's Okade Yoshio E, and it's published by Kadokawa Shoten. It's out of print, but it has, it's a step up from that book. It's got good, reasonable reproductions of his watercolor pictures. Not all 300 of them that we saw on the stream the other day, but again, one for each chapter. And it's got a, a synopsis of the story. The little book we just saw is all about the story, tiny bit about the pictures. This is more about the pictures, less about the story. So if you're interested in learning more about Okada-san's work, you can see, you know where this has come from this book. Now it doesn't have an ISBN number. I don't know why. It's got a number, but it's not an ISBN. It's unreadable. <coughs> Is it going to be readable? It's going to be unreadable. I'll just read it. 0093-872256-0946 in brackets. There's no other ISBN number. It was published in Showa 54. So for those of you who are interested, if you want to hunt it up, there's the information. And to my knowledge, that's the only place that those Genji illustrations have appeared in print, in the magazines that I showed you first, and then in these two books. Okay, moving right along. Show and tell. Okay, this is a fun one. These are some little prints that I've had for years and years and years and years and years and didn't know what I was looking at. Like, I knew they were woodblock prints. In fact, I'll give you the same little conundrum that I had for over the years. I found the answer to it now, but I didn't know the answer. Let's just look at these. Bang, here's the stack. They are woodblock prints, and they seem to be, what's the era we're looking at here? These people are working on, I think they're making soy sauce in this huge tanks. Their, their soy sauce has got to be ready. The artist is Sada Nobu Ga. Sada Nobu Ga. And you can start Googling in the background here and telling me what era, what type of prints we're looking at. Sake or soy? This is soy to show. Well, I don't know. I'll keep quiet. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, the prints have a number and a number, 17 and 11, and they have been glued into something and torn off. These are all hints, these are all big hints. Not exactly the world's greatest art, it looks like one of those second generation Hiroshige designs from Edo. These are woodblock prints. Again, it's been glued into something and it's 18 and two. We have two numbers here. And again, it's Sadanobu. They are all Sadanobu. We have a visit to a temple, and it's dated, not with a date for the print, but it says Meiji era. 
I don't think it's supposed to say the print is the Meiji era. The content you're looking at is something from the Meiji era. And it's, uh, there's a temple with a place where you do your ablutions in cold water and stuff like this. And again, it's got two, two numbers, 16 and 9. 17 and 3, and it's been stuck onto something. Now, I had no idea what these were. Again, Sadanobu. We have somebody here making washi, and it says the act of dipping washi in, uh, oh, it's got a place name that I can't read, something Muda. I can't read the place name, I'm sorry. Actually, this is interesting too. Think about the content here. Is this person indoors or outdoors? What are we looking at here? There's a branch with a cherry blossom. This looks like snow. The person is on the platform. They've left their shoes behind. There's massive pillars, as in massive temple-sized pillars. It looks like there's a wall. Are they indoors or outdoors? Why the snow? Making paper. So, Sadanobu Hasegawa. There is Sadanobu Hasegawa. And we're going to get a hint further along here in one of these. Ah, this one. <clears throat> Let me skip that for a minute because that's a bit of a misleading hint. Uh, oh, this hint is better. It says Has Sad S Sadanobu the third. We are looking at Hasegawa Sadanobu number three here out of the six. When were they made? Now, I would have guessed late Meiji, maybe Taisho. They're on a terrible, poor quality paper. 16 and 3, the numbers. Anyway, I'll skip here. Before we go through them all, I will skip to the answer. The answer is in a Japanese Yahoo auction I saw last week. And when I saw that, I realized, that's it! That's those pictures I've got upstairs. Now I get it! Copy link. Bring it down to the chat. It was a Yahoo auction that was up last week. It was for three of these, and it was a buy now auction for a thousand yen. And I clicked that. The computer keyboard was smoking. I clicked that so quickly. And you can see what's happening. Look at the three pictures in that auction. And that tells us everything that's going on here. The number is a year. It's Showa 17, the eighth month of Showa 17. These were prints associated with a magazine, but they weren't Kuchie prints, you know, the ones we have when we open the magazine and the print was stuck inside the front page of the magazine. These were cover pictures pasted on the outside surface of a magazine. And this was Showa 17, the eighth month. John's got it here, 1942. And the magazine was just simply called Kamigata, which is uh, the Kansai area, what we now call the Kansai area, you know, uh, mostly Osaka, Nara, well, I think just whatever, what we would now call Kansai. And the magazine was, you know, what did it call? Kyodo Kenkyu Kamigata, Regional Area Studies for Kamigata. And the content of the magazine would have been a historical, literary, you name it, things of that era. And Sada, Sada Nobu was hired to do the cover illustration, which was made as a woodblock print every month. And the thing ran from, I made a note here, I've lost it already. Ran from 1931 to 1945 was the run of the magazine, and it died in 1945. And one I was confused about, I should have skipped ahead and brought this. Here, look at this, look at this, look at this. This illustration was one, and before I thought this was in a magazine, this one really puzzled me. What are we seeing here? Well, we're seeing destruction. A temple has been destroyed. There's the thing from the top of the tower. It looks like there's a guy from the army here. I was thinking this was an illustration from the Second World War. It says Tennoji, no, Yon Tennoji. It's a, the, the, it's a famous temple in Osaka. And I was thinking this was an illustration of damage after the war. Wrong 
wrong wrong. Ishikawa-san looked at this this morning on her way up and she said, no, no, no. She says, this is the, uh, the Mino, she told me the, 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 the earthquake, the Muroto. She said, this is the Muroto earthquake. Don't you know about that? And I'm like, why is she speaking to me like I'm a grade two student, you know? And she's like, this is famous in Osaka. And look it up, this is 1934. This is all new to me. I learned this 90 minutes ago. I'm passing it on to you like I know all these things. In 1934, there was an earthquake, and there's a Wikipedia page for it, and it was at the time the most destructive earthquake that had ever, uh, a typhoon, typhoon, I'm using the wrong word, <laughs> Muroto typhoon. It hit Japan in the summer of 1934. Uh, thousands and thousands of people died. This is the kind of destruction they found. Tennoji was just totally destroyed. And the Wikipedia page is interesting. It's like in these times, 1934, we're seeing bigger storms than we've ever seen before. Something's going on with the global climate. And this is 1934. Whatever. Anyway, so this is not a wartime destruction picture. This is a picture of destruction in Kansai. And it's a uh, good nine, show a uh, nine, mm, whatever. So these now, for me, are really, really interesting. They're obviously illustrations. This one is some kind of contest. Oh, here we go, here we go. I don't have my mask. It's a mix. It's a package from Ome, which is going to Jed Monday morning in FedEx. It's a package from one of our printers, Sushi Cats. Sushi Cats. I'll show them to you Monday. I can't do it now. Monday. Sushi Cats. It's ready. Jed, stand by. And the third package, I don't remember what that is. That must be auction goods. Let's see. Anyway, 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 don't get sidetracked. Okay. So that, that was Osaka, it's Tennoji, which is a very famous temple in Osaka. And the, the, the typhoon clobbered that city and then destroyed, clobbered that city. So there we are, I know I have found out now what these are and there's a, there's a little bit of a bug for me because Dave has a virus, not that virus, Dave has a virus and it's, I don't know the technical scientific name for it, but Dave has the set completion virus. He has struggled in recent years to fight this off, and he's doing pretty well at this. But the fact that there is a thing called the set completion virus, it's, it's, I can make a living at this. People get our subscription prints in sets. When I first started printmaking, I made the 100 Poets series. And because it was a set, people wanted to get the whole thing, and I was able to feed my kids and all that stuff. And this is now a clear set. Publication started in 1931. It went for 14 years to 1945, and I want them all! Aizuri. Ah, there's an interesting quirk to this one, too. I've said these ones are all, they're all by the third generation Sadanobu, which is how most of these are carved, uh, are identified. And this one is different. This says Shodai Sadanobu. Now Shodai is the first, he's the original Sadanobu who started that lineage off, and he was dead long, 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 long before this, uh, this, uh, this series came along. So I think what they've done is at this point, just they have used, he, the Sadanobu who was hired to do this job has used one of his grandfather's images for the print that was done this month, uh, Showa 11, not sure, Showa 11, uh, the eighth month. What's happening here? Oh, it's it's uh, it's Kiyomizudera. It's the 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 water falling at Kiyomizudera, right? There's the three uh, streams, the waterfalls that fall below the. It must be up at the top here. Is Kiyomizu Temple? Yeah, yeah, it's there. It's there. Kiyomizudera, something Kiyomizudera no Taki, you know? The waterfalls at the Kiyomizu Temple in Kyoto. They're not, absolutely, they're not all great art, whatever. These are illustrations, done to fit a magazine, and some of them will have done, be done under time pressure, I'm sure. 
They're not all great art. They're attractive little pieces. Show 16, December. This one is very much uh, a cliche type traditional ukiyo-e print. Interesting mix though. Interesting mix. It's very much an old ukiyo-e style, but we have gas lamps on the bridge. <laughs> These are cool. None of this is great art at all. It's illustration work, but the printing is just so nicely done. I mean, look at this. For a little sticker that was going to be placed on the front of a book, it's nicely drawn, beautifully, beautifully carved, and averagely nicely printed. Now, for someone like me who's a carver, just these lines, every single line you see has nice taste. You know, if Taran is here this morning, he'll be looking at this thinking, oh my God, e ne. Every single line, every unimportant line in the middle of this straw dummy that these guys are building, every line has chup, chup. The knife goes in, the knife goes out, you see taste. It is so beautifully done. And we've come back to the same topic a thousand times in my work here. These craftsmen were not, uh, they were not people saying, okay, we got a special job to do, hold your breath, ready, let's do this, okay, we got it. No, these were guys just going chop, 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 next, okay, chop, 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 oh, gotta get going, lunchtime, chop, 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 chop. Casual craftsmen doing their job so well, the results are just magnificent. Even a simple, cheap, little, worthless piece of paper like this is gloriously, gloriously made. It just, human beings are cool. If this was in a print shop downtown, it would be 100 yen. Nobody wants this stuff. It's in the 100 yen junk box in a print shop downtown. 30 colors, I don't even know how many colors it is. Gloriously carved. A treasure, an absolute treasure. And this is, these days, this is my value to society. Everybody knows about the Utamaro prints. Everybody knows about the Sharaku and the art. Nobody knows about the gorgeous beauty of the prints in this tradition. And this is about the end of it, 1945. We're, you know, this magazine closed doors in 1945. That was about it. Okay, anyway, anyway, anyway. Square prints, tough to design. That's really tough for a design. Really tough, really tough. Okay, anyway, here we are. I, I don't have my mask. I didn't bring my, my, it's warm this morning. I didn't bring my puffy jacket with a mask in the pocket. So I can't mask up for you. Anyway, time to sign off. It's Saturday morning. I will see you now, two days from now, Monday morning for the last print, uh, the last stream in this week's series. Then on Monday afternoon or Tuesday, I'm gonna be heading out to Ome. I have to go to the tax office first because it's tax time. And then I've gotta go and fix a printer over in the Ome workshop. Okay, see you in two days. Look at that, quiet, quiet, quiet. There's the only people you will see without masks, elementary school kids. From middle school and up, it's Mask City here. Okay, signing off. I'm out to get some chai tea. Bye for now, see you on Monday. Signing off.